Red River, Tennessee, 1817. A farmhouse belonging to a man named John Bell has been the site of many unexplained phenomena. Bell and his family are being tormented with strange sightings and unexplained sounds that seem to grow more hostile over time. One of John's daughters, Betsy, is the target of an invisible apparition to the point where she fears for her safety in her own home. Her parents eventually send her to a neighbor's house, hoping she'll be able to sleep peacefully. At first, things appear calm as Betsy and her neighbors turn in for the night. But then the silence and tranquility of the house shatters as the door flies open with a bang and a gust of wind blows violently through the dark room. One of the neighbors hurries to light a candle, but as the flame casts its glow across the room, the three of them are bewildered to see the door is actually still closed. It's then that Betsy hears the dreaded voice that's been haunting her and her father. It whispers to her, This terrifying incident was just one of the many hauntings that tormented the Bell family during the years and generations that followed the events of 1817. In this episode of Haunting History, we'll explore each of the paranormal events that took place at this farmhouse, the accounts of those who dwelled on the property, and the incidents that took place later, sometimes generations later. We'll also examine possible explanations that folklorists and historians have offered to explain this phenomenon, which at the time was blamed on a frightful entity. I'm James Troop, and this is the haunting history of the Bell Witch. Red River, which is located in the current city of Adams, Tennessee, was once home to a pious community of farmers. Religion was a large part of society during this time, and Baptist churches were often at the center of their communities. Some of the wealthier farmers in the area were enslavers and would buy and sell people who were enslaved in order to work their large plots of land. These factors would be considered by historians years later to possibly explain the mystery of the Bell Witch, along with the misery and death it brought to one unfortunate family. John Bell moved his large family from North Carolina to Red River, where he purchased a 320-acre farm in 1804. John became known in the community as one of the wealthier farmers whose land was primarily maintained by the people he enslaved. He rose to greater prominence as an elder at the Red River Baptist Church, where he, along with his spouse and children, frequently attended. The rest of the Bell family consisted of his wife Lucy, his children, Jesse, Drury, John Jr., Benjamin, Esther, Zadok, Elizabeth, who was called Betsy, and his two younger sons, Richard and Joel. The family became successfully established for 13 years until the unexplainable sightings began. Bell family members and people enslaved on the farm started to notice unusual animals passing through the property in the summer of 1817. Some of these animals were unidentifiable and others had a canine appearance, but they behaved strangely and had unnatural features. One of these reported sightings described an animal with the body of a black dog and the head of a rabbit with glowing red eyes. One of the people enslaved at the Bell Farmhouse, a man named Dean, described a large black dog that began stalking and attacking him. The other people who were enslaved on the farm began encountering unexplainable phenomena, such as getting locked out of doorways mysteriously. In the woods around the property, people began seeing dead man's candles or balls of flickering light at the tree line at nightfall. 
to the horror of those that watched, these lights would appear to move closer to the farmhouse, but they never reached the property. They just continued to hover ominously around the edge of the woods. It wasn't long before the strange phenomenon began happening inside the home, primarily in the form of disturbing noises. Family members reported a number of strange sounds that seemed to come out of nowhere and without any source. Doors would knock with no one behind them. The sound of chains dragging on the ground would be heard in an empty room. Rats were heard gnawing and scratching on the bedposts as the bells tried to sleep. This sound became even more sinister and distressful, as though something invisible was gulping and choking. Finally, the bells began to hear the disembodied voice of a woman. By now, John Bell suspected that he and his family were being haunted by a witch. He elicited the help of preachers and friends to try and communicate with the witch and figure out what it wanted. They were able to make contact with the entity, who revealed that its name was Kate. These communications soon took a menacing turn, and the voice would describe its intention to kill John Bell. The witch seemed to make clear that he was the primary target, but the witch also tormented Betsy Bell regularly. Betsy would feel painful and shocking sensations as though she was being hit, stuck with pins, scratched, and even beaten. But oddly, sometimes the witch would behave like a possessive mother towards her. Betsy claimed that after the chilling incident at the neighbor's house, the witch assured her that it would not bother her or the neighbors again that night, and she felt a hand gently pat her cheek. At the time, Betsy had plans to get married to another neighbor named Joshua Gardner, but her interactions with him seemed to further anger the witch. Betsy believed that the apparition wanted to keep her and Joshua apart. The perturbing encounters with the witch eventually became too much for them to bear, and the couple broke off their engagement within the year. The witch also seemed to take a liking to John's wife, Lucy, but remained hostile to him and his daughter. This torment would continue for three years, escalating to violence. More of the people enslaved on the farm reported attacks from the witch and being tripped by an invisible force. The younger children would report events akin to being beaten. The voice of the bell witch seemed to become more malicious, yelling, shrieking, and at times mimicking the voices of various family members. On one occasion, it stated, Mr. Bell is a bad man. Word of the Bells' haunting spread over time and would attract visitors from Tennessee and Kentucky. Paranormal enthusiasts wanted a glimpse of evidence, and some would get more than they'd hoped for and become victims of attacks themselves. According to Bell Witch author Pat Fitzhugh, the more people who tried to talk to this thing, the more attention it was paid, the louder it became, as though it was feeding off of people's fear. A man named Frank Miles arrived at the farmhouse, wanting to personally challenge the witch, declaring he was too big and strong to be affected by the haunting. He was a very large man, supposedly seven feet tall and 300 pounds. The Bells agreed to have Miles spend the night, but they were soon woken up to find him sprinting around the house, terrified. Before they could react, Miles frantically ran from the home and never returned. The Bell Witch became so infamous, it attracted the likes of President Andrew Jackson. President Jackson owned land in Red River and was familiar with the area. In 1819, he tried to travel to see the phenomenon for himself. But before he could even reach the property, he and the other men traveling alongside him were reportedly threatened by an invisible force. As they traveled up the road, one of the wheels of Jackson's carriage became stuck inexplicably. 
Jackson suddenly heard a woman's voice. He reportedly stated, By the eternal, boys, this is the witch. The voice came again, this time audibly for all the men, saying, All right, General, let the wagon go. I'll see you again tonight. After this, Jackson's carriage was able to move again. Not one to be deterred, Jackson and his party pressed on, perhaps more intrigued by this encounter. They set up camp for the night and planned to continue their journey to the farmhouse in the morning. But the entity came to them again as it had promised. One of the members of Jackson's party was a self-proclaimed witch hunter. He tried to fire a pistol, but to his bewilderment, it would not fire. Soon after, the witch hunter was baffled when he was struck by an invisible force. After this attack, Jackson's party decided it was best they turn around and journey back to Nashville instead. By 1820, the Bell family had suffered great physical abuse and psychological torture from the Bell Witch, and it was taking its toll on them. As the legend of the Bell Witch grew, so did the intensity of the paranormal attacks. The hauntings continued to escalate and would finally take a deadly turn in December of that year after John Bell suddenly fell into a coma. For some time, John Bell had been experiencing difficulty swallowing and strange sensations in his mouth and face, all in addition to the usual harm caused by the Bell Witch. He was 70 years old, and the outcome of this mysterious illness wasn't promising. Not long after these symptoms appeared, John was found unconscious in his bed. The following morning, John's family came to check on him, but realized with dread that he had passed. This dread turned into confusion and horror when John Bell Jr. discovered a dark liquid next to the bed and he began to hear laughing and singing. The Bell family reported that the disembodied voice of the Bell Witch took credit for killing John Bell with poison, the dark liquid that was found next to him. The continued laughter and singing could be heard at his funeral days later. However, after John Bell's body was lowered into the ground, a mournful yet peaceful silence settled over the Bell farmhouse for the first time in three years. It was as if the witch had done what it had set out to do. It would seem that the hauntings had finally ceased, and the Bell family hoped to finally feel comfortable in their own home once more. Betsy Bell went on to marry Richard Powell, who was a former teacher of hers, and moved to Mississippi. Her ex-fiance, Joshua, ended up working as a sheriff and later began a railroad company with his brother. He died at 84 after a life free from hauntings, wealthy from his ventures. One of the younger Bell children, Richard, was only six years old when the witch began to torment his family. But as he grew older, he wrote down his memories of the terrifying experience in his diary. He eventually wrote a book based on these writings titled Our Family Trouble, The Story of the Bell Witch of Tennessee. Jesse Bell and John Bell Jr. married sisters Martha and Elizabeth Gunn, the daughters of prominent Reverend Thomas Gunn. The horrors his family battled began to fade from John Jr.'s mind as he found his own success as a farmer in Robertson County. But after eight years of silence, the witch would return to pay him a visit. In 1828, John Bell Jr. reportedly encountered the Bell Witch once more. He described the witch haunting him, speaking about the past, present, and future for three consecutive days. Before she disappeared on the third day, she descended into a ball of light and gave a chilling prophecy that she would return in 107 years to haunt John Jr.'s 
most direct descendant. This would have been the year 1935, and as far as researchers can tell, there's no evidence or claim story of any hauntings from Bell's ancestors during this year. But this wasn't the end of the Bell Witch phenomenon. 62 years after John Jr.'s last encounter with the Bell Witch, the legend was solidified in many areas of the South. So when a mysterious series of events took place in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, some were quick to blame the infamous entity. A Presbyterian preacher named Reverend Kuwait and his wife began experiencing a violent paranormal event out of the blue in 1890. They reported that lumps of coal began falling from the walls and ceilings into the family room for several hours. The amount and the force of the coal was so great that it broke furniture, smashed windows, and one lump of coal even struck Miss Kuwait's head and wounded her. The phenomenon happened at least three times and was reported on both Wednesday and Friday. According to the Quaits' report, there was no possible way the coal could have fallen from the roof and through the ceiling. Many newspapers covered the phenomenon with one naming the celebrated witches of Robertson County as the possible perpetrators. Reverend Quaite himself believed the coal was being thrown by supernatural agencies. However, another publication suggested that the coal could have possibly been thrown by pranksters from outside of the house. It cited an incident years prior where a supposed ghost had caused excitement in the town, but it ended up being the pranks of a man named Hickman who left town after being found out. Following this event, no other hauntings were attributed to the Bell Witch until the turn of the century. Is there any evidence to suggest that the original Bell Witch hauntings could have been the actions of an individual rather than an otherworldly being? Some people believe that there are few key factors surrounding the socio-political climate of the late 1810s that could offer a temporal explanation. Some point out that arsenic poisoning was becoming increasingly common in Europe and the United States during this time. Laws were actively being written to create specific punishments for those who used arsenic as a means of poisoning. In some instances, in an attempt to escape enslavement, some enslaved people would utilize this poison on their enslavers, and there were already multiple reports of enslaver poisonings around the time the Bell Witch hauntings took place. So, it is not out of the realm of possibility that Dean and the other people enslaved at the Bell farmhouse used the story of the black dog attacks and other strange occurrences to provide a possible explanation in their pursuit of freedom. Others point to another possible culprit for the poisoning and possibly the through-going Bell Witch hauntings. Another neighbor to the Bells was Mary Catherine Batts, or Kate, as she was commonly called. Early on, an older man in the Batts family and John Bell had a dispute over the sale of an enslaved person. Since then, the families were known to feud. Because of this dispute, and the fact that the voice of the witch answered to Kate, Mary Catherine Batts was the prime suspect of the poisoning and the true identity of the Bell Witch for a time. However, she continuously denied this claim, and there's no solid evidence linking her to any of the hauntings or the poisoning. As time went on, people in the community found it more fitting to label the death of John Bell and his experiences as paranormal. Some even theorized that the haunting could have been the result of the spirit of an indigenous person whose grave had been disturbed rather than the evil workings of a witch. As spirituality and religion were a dominant part of the daily life for the citizens of Red River, the spirits of the dead were considered to be as real as living people. 
as was the existence of witchcraft. Dr. Rick Gregory, who is a historian and storyteller, offers further clarity on the acceptance of spirits in pious communities like Red River. The Bible is full of witches, so when something's going on here, it's very easy to make that transition to this is a witch. This is a supernatural entity, as we find in the Bible quite often. Once some people believe it, that can lead other people to believe it. Think about communal norms. As a core group of people started believing it, well, I want to fit in here. This is where I live. While there's still debate about who the perpetrator was and whether they were of flesh and blood, there is strong evidence that John Bell was indeed killed by an arsenic poisoning. A chemistry professor called the attention to additional details after studying some of the accounts recorded by Richard Bell. Dr. Megan Mann, an assistant chemistry professor at Austin P. State University, notes that his son talked about all these strange medical symptoms he was having, and a lot of them sounded very neurological to me. He would have trouble swallowing, and his tongue felt weird. He would start getting this weird twitching sensation in his face, and eventually it grew to the point where it was kind of impacting him and other parts of his body. She suspects that these symptoms are consistent with heavy metal poisoning, specifically arsenic. She also points out another detail in Richard Bell's account. It turns out that the Bell family actually investigated the dark liquid found next to John Bell's deathbed to some degree. They gave some to a cat, which died the next day after ingesting it. They also threw the liquid into the fireplace and reported that the flames momentarily burned blue. Both of these details further point to arsenic poisoning. Mann does note, however, that not all of the story elements can be explained this way, and some of the occurrence, such as John Bell's shoes flying off in the middle of the night as he slept, cannot be explained by science or human activity. As far as we know, the 1930s came and went peacefully for the descendants of the Bell family, in spite of the witch's supposed prophecy, as detailed by John Jr. However, there was a modern-day ancestor of the Bells that did indeed experience a series of strange occurrences which ended up being linked to an artifact of his family's past. Bob Bell is the fifth great-grandson of John Bell, who currently resides in Springfield, Tennessee. In a 2018 interview, he shared an account of some bizarre and frightening phenomena he and his grandmother experienced within her home while growing up. He describes how his grandmother's china would fly out of the cabinet and onto the floor, somehow without breaking. My grandmother called, terrified. Come to the house, quick. When we got there, we looked at the butler's pantry and all the doors were open. Every single piece of china had crashed on the kitchen floor. They fell from eight feet up and they were covering the floor and every single piece was still intact. We well, can't explain that one. Bob also recounted hearing disembodied sounds within his grandmother's home, like the sounds of heavy footsteps coming down the hallway. He remembers hearing the footsteps and grabbing a baseball bat to defend himself. But each time he looked for the source of the footsteps, there was nothing there. These mysterious events continued until Bob eventually discovered an old family Bible in his grandmother's basement, which was dated 1820, the last year of the original Bell Witch hauntings. Once the Bible was removed from his grandmother's property, the frightening experiences ceased. Bob is still involved today in carrying on the legend of the Bell Witch hauntings. For example, a play titled Spirit was written by David Alford based on the writings of Richard Bell. This play is put on locally in Adams, Tennessee every October, and it retells the original story of the Bell Witch. 
Bob is often cast as his fifth great-grandfather, John Bell, and he travels from Springfield to Adams to perform in the play. Another direct descendant of John Bell, named John Kellick, was featured on an A&E television series titled Cursed, The Bell Witch, where he further investigates the hauntings. Bob Bell appears on this series as well, along with a host of other consultants who specialize in paranormal ventures. Some even offer their own independent explanations for the phenomena. The legend of the Bell Witch lives on in other pieces of fictional media as well, such as Little Sister Death, a fictional novel by William Gay. It also serves as the inspiration for the 2013 horror movie, The Bell Witch Haunting. Regardless of what can or can't be proven when it comes to the Bell Witch Haunting, there's no question of the enormous impact it had on the Bell family descendants, the local lore of Adams, Tennessee, and the national zeitgeist of the American 19th century. Let us know in the comments of any other infamous spirits or entities we should illuminate in this series. I'm James Troop. Thank you again for joining me and tuning in to this installment of Haunting History.